how some people, uh, they'll see you in life and, and they have a whole lot of advice for you. Um, they'll tell you a whole lot of stuff that you should not do or you ought not do. Um, and so you really have to sift through that stuff. Um, every now and then, Michelle, you have to just walk away and not entertain uh, any of that stuff that folk are taking, especially those of us who still work on your job. You better be careful how folk tell you how to do this, especially in the oil and chemical business, open this veil or close that veil. You better make sure you know what you're doing because some folk will act like they know what they're talking about, but they really have no clue. And you can be trapped, amen, lights. That, that, see, it, it relates to the Christian realm because those of us, uh, those of, of the people who are unbelievers who call themselves Christian, uh, they will say and do anything to impress you about uh, their religion when they really don't have any religion. Fake, fake, people know how to fake it and shake it. And so sometimes they will uh, act like they know what they're talking about. We're talking about Christians now. We're talking about them, and it's going to match into the lesson. We've got some people, rather than reading and get a good interpretation of what Jesus says, they will paraphrase it and miss it and steer somebody wrong. That's false teaching. Now, let's see if we can help you a little bit more. My granny told me a long time ago, she says, every now and then, you just have to ignore ignorance. You don't even respond to it. Just look at them and keep walking. It does two things. Number one, it lets the person know you're not buying that. And number two, it saves your joy because every now and then, that's what folk are trying to do. Steal your joy. You'd be surprised how folk will walk up to you knowing the answer to everything. And will ask you a question. That they know that it should take you off. But you need to just ignore it and keep doing your best. And it's, all, it, it's always like that. Whenever it seems like you're doing your best, that's when folk will have a suggestion how you ought to do it. it. It's hard to have somebody in the church that don't work in the church tell you how you ought to do work in the church. It, it's hard for somebody who don't sing to tell you what key to sing in if they can't do it themselves. Are you with me here? So sometimes you've just got to ignore it and keep giving your best. In our text today, uh, we have Jesus, who is uh, our prime target. Uh, he, he is the one who's doing his best, but here he's got church folk standing on the outside telling him what he ought to do. Come and go with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. And we're going to start at verse 29. King James Version. Mark's Gospel. King James. Chapter 15. And we're going to start at verse 29. And just read with me, if you will. If you got it, say God. Okay, read some of this wise. And they that passed by railed, and railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and builds it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, Descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled, reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, la sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God. Why has that? Why has that? Why has thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, "Behold, he called Elias." 
And one ran and filled a sponge, filled a vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he, so he cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. I'd like to talk to you from this thought. In spite of, Jesus gave himself. In spite of, Jesus gave himself. Amen. That there is a contrast here. Here are the Sanhedrin Council, the chief priests and the scribes. If anybody should have known who Jesus was, it should have been them. They had been studying the word, they had been studying the, uh, the word that he was coming, and uh, they were filled with jealousy because they had been there all the time. But yet Jesus, in a short time, was building up a following. And they were leaving the synagogues and going to find Jesus and John. You have to understand when there's church folk who is jealousy and cannot deal with jealousy, they'll do anything to shut you up. And here there in the background, one uh, and the other, they're talking about the three days. Remember Jesus said, I talk in power because those who need to hear uh, won't hear. Uh, you know, that they need to hear, they won't hear it. So I talk in parables so those I talk to, they'll understand it. And so here they were thinking that the temple that it took years to build, uh, that, that's what he was talking about, the, the big temple that they worshiped then. But Jesus was talking about himself. And so they missed the mark. And so they were mocking him. Isn't it amazing how when you're going through terrible situations, people have the nerve to laugh? People have to tell you, well, why don't you call on your God? Uh, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? You have to ignore ignorance because those who don't believe are very ignorant for the, fact, for the fact that the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So you know you're dealing with a fool up front, right? And you know we don't hold conversations with what? Fools. Because uh, if someone would walk by and see you arguing with a fool, they don't know which one is. And so don't waste your time dealing with foolish things. And so we have to understand that Jesus is sitting here. Now let me give you a little bit of history of what people had told Jesus along the way. It just didn't start from this chapter. Big Mama, Satan told Jesus, serve yourself. In Matthew 4, 3 through 4. Uh, if you'll just turn these stones to bread, uh, if you'll just fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus replied, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have to understand that folk been trying to advise Jesus for a long time. And so you have to be ready to ignore foolishness. Peter said, and we know Peter is the one who denied Jesus. Uh, Peter, uh, we went through that last sermon, uh, that he traveled from afar, following Jesus from judgment hall to judgment hall. Jesus is, is, is relating to him, his, his disciples and those around who are working with him. And he says, paraphrasing, I, I'm going to have to be offered up uh, before evil men. I'm going to have to die. Uh, I've got to do it for you. And here it is Peter saying, uh, pity yourself. Uh, surely that's not going to happen to you. And he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You have to understand that folk have been trying to advise Jesus. Jesus is intelligent because he knows not to listen to any of that stuff. You know how Jesus knows? Because he is the word. And now he's a living flesh. So he recognizes that Satan is trying to set up a bill, bill of goods. He realizes that Peter don't know what he's talking about. He, he's versed in a discipleship, but he's not ready to match arms with God. 
And so God dismisses. He didn't say, I, I didn't use you. Uh, but isn't it amazing how in the time of need, in the time of critical uh, uh, things in your life, someone always want to give you some bad advice. The way you know it's bad, you ought to read. When someone tells you something, try this or try that, you ought to at least put it to the test. There are a lot of folk who will try to sell you a bill of goods. Even, even which more hurting, his unsaved relatives said, you know, you do all this stuff. What man does all this stuff and don't want to be known about it? And see, what they were looking at is that Jesus was working miracles, he was doing different things, Johnson, and all of a sudden, uh, he said, don't tell nobody. Yeah. The blind man, don't tell nobody. The lame man, don't, just go show yourself to the priest. And they say, nobody does good for nothing. They want to be seen. But Jesus is not here for popularity. He is already the number one person in the world. So he does not have to prove his worth. He, he does not have to prove his popularity because they already know that they're leaving the churches going to hear Jesus. And the good thing about it is Jesus is doing miracles that they can't do. And so here it is. They, they complain. It's bad enough to have an outsider uh, deny Christ, but it's even harder when your own family Say that there is no God. And you're doing it for the wrong. When folk tell you that you're doing and serving God for the wrong reason, just keep on serving. Just ignore what they say. Because Satan loves misery. And misery loves company. And they try to get you dejected and all frustrated and perplexed about uh, your Lord. They'll say something like this. Well, uh, you say your Lord will come whenever you go on through things. Uh, why is he not here? Uh, or why did he let those three young girls die in that wreck the other day? You have to understand that God does whatever he wants to do because we all belong to him and he doesn't have to ask us anything or any permission to take any one of us out of here. And then you need to look at this, that none of us are worthy. No, not one. Not one. So the thing about it is that we have to understand that God does what he needs to do without checking with us first. That's why it's important for us to serve God and realize him and be like old man Job. Even though he slay me, I'm still going to serve him. And so that's what we have to walk through uh, with God. But here, the people that should have known better, that should have showed, showed sympathy to Jesus, was rushing on to the cross. But what they did not realize, Brother Bill, is that Jesus was going to the cross not only for the Jew, but for the Gentile too, for the whole world. And here it is that, isn't it amazing how when you're trying to do your best work, somebody always come back? Even if you're working on an old car, just when you get the boat almost screwed in there, you've been wrestling with it for two or three hours, somebody stopped by and said, hey, what you doing? That, that's In Christianity, folk will do that. Just as you're on your way out of the door to a program or to a church, here come long lost Uncle Henry. <laughs> and, and, and he hadn't seen in a long time and wants you to stop. And when you invite him to come and go with you, no, I'm going to move on down the road a little further. Nothing but Satan. You have to understand, folk will ask you, say, well, why do you serve God so much? I could never repay God for what he's done for me and my family. Never repay God for what he's done for this Bell Zion family. And so we have to understand that you need to serve the Lord. And you have a lot of folk who will stop you from serving God. The very people that he put in place, allowed to be in place as the priest, as the leaders, were doing false teaching. It, 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 it's a sad thing to say in Christianity that there is jealousy. But it is. It's, you see it in the text. Here Jesus is coming to love and to save. And you've got church folk who are deriding him, laughing at him. Uh, he saved many, but he can't save himself. 
that Jesus could have called 10 legions of angels. The text says that he could have called 10,000 uh, angels to his rescue, but because of love, he stayed right there. It's hard to love somebody when they are deriding you. It's hard to love somebody when they're making fun of you. And to our young people, when folk make fun of you, just keep on walking. If they make fun of your clothes, if they make fun of you, or if you have a list or whatever, just don't say anything. You see, if you say something, that's fuel for the fire. But if you leave them there talking to themselves and teasing, it makes them look just what like they are. You need to understand that God's got your back. You don't have to worry about that. Just the name of Jesus can make Satan flee. And so here it is that Jesus is walking this way and he says, he says, and they that pass by railing ra ra on him are uh, wagging their heads and saying, ah, thou destroy the temple and buildest it up in three days, this man can't come down. No, love is what held him there. It wasn't the nails in his hands or the spikes in his feet. It was love that held Jesus there for you and I. Don't ever forget that. And here you got fools walking around the cross. Don't kid yourself. Everybody that was at the foot of the cross were not Christians. Everybody that come through the doors of the church, even though they dress like it, and they clap like it, and they rock their heads like it, don't mean that they are true Christians. That's just the real truth. Uh, it's good they hear, but by your actions, we are observant of you. If you come to church all the time and we never see you having a community or giving back to the community, that says something about Christianity. And so even the colleges got sense enough to where they will call this church <laughs> have they served? And you know what? It's important because if it comes down to two people with almost the same transcript, That's it. That's they A students, they are honor students, but if one has served the community, guess who will get them? That's, that's true. And so if the world got sense enough to serve, we Christians who say that we love the Lord, ought to be serving. We ought to be able to serve somewhere. There's a lot of stuff to do in the church. And we don't have to bump in the fold. And, and God forbid that you got to be over the overseer or the over person just to work in the church. You ought to work because you are seen. And you ought to be willing to contribute because we, we all don't have the same talent. And so God gave us different talents and different avenues to work in the church, and we are a great well uh, all machine when we work together without jealousy. Amen? Amen. And so we hear that uh, they were uh, jealous. And you have certain folk who are following you, uh, just like uh, here, uh, you know, Pilate was compromising. You need to be one way or the other. I find no fault in this man. You all let him go. But the Sanhedrin council had planned for saying crucify. The same folk, now listen to me carefully, the same folk that you pray for, the same folk that you feed, no doubt are some of the same folk who will put you down. Let, let me tell you a story. That was John Carlton Allen, and some of you might have heard it is uh, Lady John Carlton Allen, he was out of San Antonio, Texas, and he told me as a young minister, told me right here, uh, as I was serving as an pastor, he said, Pastor, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I call you pastor because if you never ever pass again, you're pastoring right now. He says, the same folk that you will go out and stretch your neck out for, he said, will turn on you in an instant. He said, let me help you. He says, here is a young man who goes down and robs somebody with a gun. And he's on trial. John says, every day that that judge came in and out, even at lunchtime, he was sitting right there, praying. And he said, he took his lunch in a brown paper bag. He never left a 
unless he had to go relieve himself, he says he stayed right there. So the trial went on for a week. The law demanded that the minimum time was 10 years. Listen to me carefully. 10 years. When the judge called the young man up to read his sentence, he said, do you know that man right there? He said, yes, my pastor. He said, every day I've come in, morning, noon, and evening. He said, the first person I saw was your pastor. He says, the law demands that you get 10 years. That, that's the minimum. He said, others already served time for the same crime. He said, but because of your pastor, I'm going to give you 10 years probation. I'm going to give you 10 years probation. Having pity on the young man because of a Christian pastor. He says, a few weeks later, he was going out of town. He had forgot something at the church. And he went through the back door of the church rather than what he normally go through. And that was the father of the son who was giving his secretary nothing but pure hell. And she said, well, you know the pastor's not going to like that. He told her, and this is what I'm quoting, quote, um, you tell him he puts his clothes on just like I do. Here it is. He has prayed for five days, morning, noon, and evening. And this is what you get. This is the appreciation that you get from some folk. Here it is, Jesus, done good. Dying for Going to bat for him. Causing the lame to walk and the blind to see. And if anybody should have showed sympathy, it should have been the Sanhedrin Council and Scribes. But they are there mocking him and deriding him. But they're supposed to be Christians. That's a sad situation. You know, and I'm almost through with this, we have to understand that sometimes this Christian business can get lonely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every now and then, this Christian business can get perplexing, Sister Connie, because we oftentimes wonder, if you're really a Christian, how can you say that? How can you do that? How can you go there? We need to ask ourselves, Jesus gave it all. He paid it all out on the hill called Calvary. The question, Sister Matthew, is that we ought to be asking ourselves is what has we given? What have we given to the Lord? Have we let God use us as human agents to help us? And if we did it, did we brag about it, Big Mama? Did we broadcast it down the street? See, God wants to get a blessing through you for you to give it to somebody else. Yes, yes. And a lot of times we sit on God's blessing and we don't want to help anybody else. Don't let jealousy overrule your action. Yes. The thing about it is that we have to understand the crowd at Calvary says, save yourself. Uh, come down off the cross. Yes. See, they really didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Uh, he had already consulted with his father in the, in the, in the olive garden. And so, here it is. Can this bitter cup be removed? No, son. If you're going to go, you got to go all the way. And so we need to understand that Jesus has already made it clear. He's ready. You, you know what? I, I like that. When you got a made-up mind, you're not going to let anybody turn you around. And I'm so glad. It was a shameful death. But I'm so glad that Jesus did not let religious men who wore fancy robes and of uh, uh, turbans and you see it's okay to dress in your ritual stuff but your ritual stuff ought not be guiding you to your decision it ought to be a God Almighty that guards you and guides you and directs you to help people along the way but but here it is they said save yourself even a sinner on the cross has the audacity to say Save, save, save yourself and us too. Then one man will have to say, you know what, we deserve to die. But this man has done nothing. But isn't it amazing how when folk, uh, they call it bullying. <coughs> bullying is nothing but one person who's trying to degrade another person because of jealousy. 
if you look in every corner of it, it's about jealousy. They don't like your clothes. They don't like where you live. Had three young girls the other day kill one of their friends because of jealousy. I don't like what you wear. I don't like the way you do your hair. And it's sad enough in the world, but it's even sadder when it's in the church. I can't work because they didn't put me over. I can't serve because I can't stand this person or that person. Jesus worked with sinners and ate with them. Go ahead now. And looked beyond their faults. Hello, somebody. And so that means Jesus deal with us and we're sinners. And then we want to look down upon somebody else. The thing is that Jesus did not let other folks stop him from doing his work. That's my point to you. In spite of Jesus gave himself. And you know what? That's all that God is looking for us to do is give to him of ourselves. The thing says, what can I render unto the Lord who has everything? I can render unto him my body and my soul. That's all he's looking for. He's not looking for our bank account. He's not looking for who looks the best. He's looking for one who's going to serve the best. That's why he says, uh, in, uh, in, in, his, in his talking with the disciples, those who want to be great are going to be the least. That's it, that's it. And the least, the ones who serve are going to be greater. That's why Jesus, at the institution of the Lord's Supper, which you're getting ready to participate in very quickly, um, he, he says, I'm going to show you humility. I'm going to wash your feet. Feet washing was left to servants. Jesus came here to serve. And he set an example for his disciples. If you can't do this, and Peter, if you don't want me to wash your feet, you'll have nothing to do with me. Because if you deny it, guess what? You don't have the humility it needs. It takes humility. It takes patience to be a Christian. Maybe I need to say that again. It takes patience to be a Christian. Because there are folk who will get on your last nerve. And if you let them control your life, you'll be sad. And you'll be frustrated because of what somebody said. When someone says something to you that upset you, think about the person. Pray for them. And just keep talking to God. Don't say anything to the person. Just pray for them. And just walk away. Keep on walking with the Lord. Keep on talking with the Lord. And he will get you through. Because we have folk who want to see you destroyed because of who you serve. You need to understand that God wants a bold Christian who will stand up and say, yes, he is Lord. Now here's a contrast we close this. Here are Jewish descendants, children of Israel, who know the word, study the word, the scribes interpret the word, writes the words, publish the words, and they're denying Christ, ridiculing him, but here's a centurion, who's a Gentile, who stands out the cross and sees what goes on from the sixth to the ninth hour, grows down. And he stands up and says, truly, this must be the Son of God. And we've got folk who say they've been in the church 40 years. Never make that statement. We need to understand that God is looking for somebody that will serve him in spite of what you're going through. Sister, how do you serve God when you are going through trying things because he's done so much for you? And if he doesn't do anything else for me, he's already done enough. I, I can't thank him enough for what he has done for me. I'm like that centurion. When you see some things, when you feel God moving on the altar of your heart, you ought to be ready to tell somebody 
that he's real. That he lives and he doesn't have to prove anything to you that he's God. But I'll tell you what, if you're trusting, if you believe in him, he will come through for you. And even like Brother Paul, even if he don't remove the thorn, he'll make you better to deal with the situation. All of us over 50 got something wrong with us. Would it be arthritis, diabetes, headaches, sinus problems? We've got something that we're going to have along the way. But even though we got it, we ought to still be able to say it. We ought to not just give up because we move a little slow. And if you keep on saying good morning, you will move a little slow. But God is a good God. He gave of himself in spite of. When they say you can't hold a dog, Just keep on singing. When you're rocking from side to side because the Holy Spirit has kicked in, just, just move over a little further. And, and you know how to get room? Just be like a wing. Just, just, just start shouting and praising God. They'll make room for you. Folk don't like to see other folks shout. That's why I say it so many times when, when folk are shouting and no, no hard feelings toward them, let them shout. Stop fanning them. Don't need to shout. Just don't let them hurt themselves. Just stay there and hold them, but don't fan them. That's the Holy Spirit. You can't put it out nowhere. That's why they holler until they get ready. But every now and then, you just got to say, hey, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and beat it by every tongue. Every now and then, you just got to shout. Don't, don't worry about who's beside you because uh, I'll be like that lady when she had worked so hard and uh, they had a sign up at the graduation, please hold your applause to late. When everybody has clear to say, yeah, then you can applaud. She says, I've scrubbed too many floors. I've worked too hard. I've worked two or three jobs. I had to make stuff work when even it looked like it wouldn't fit together. She says, when my son walks that stage, she said, y'all better give me a little room. Because nobody but the Lord made that possible. So I'm going to shout. And when that sister got to shout, they were shouting all over the building. Because they realized, too, that it was nobody but the Lord. Every now and then, you just got to shout. Don't worry about the person sitting on the and it's okay if you do it's better when you do If you're the part that you owe for, you can't praise him as much. You don't want to tear it up, but honey, if you know who let's go ahead and praise